Right then, so we had a little sit, sit on that branch a minute ago just to get our breath. We are gradually going up. We wouldn't know we were going up because what happens is a bit of zigzagging that gets you up. It's only when you get to the top and you look down and think, God, I've just climbed up there. But you're actually zigzagging. See what I'm doing now? This is where the ticks will get you, though. If they can catch you on the brambles, they will. So, this is the most risky part. Going up here in a minute. Especially if they haven't cut back the brambles. Um, it's risky. This bit looks quite clear, actually. There's a big tree that usually has a swing on it for people. It's doing well. All the trees look well. You can, if you're fit, just go straight up. But look at all the rubbish. People have sat up there and just thrown cans down. They're so naughty. I've not really noticed that before. So that's not very good. So we do what we're doing, we're going to go zigzag. That's how we get up the steep part of the hill. Unless you want to go straight up. And I have done that before. When it's been over brambleized here. I don't have the energy today to do it. So I'm not going to. I'm going to do the zigzag. And it has been cut a bit, I reckon. I've known it a lot more overgrown than this. So today we've had a variety of little walks. Hold on, there's a spider. Is it a tick? Wait a minute. We do get these. That's the trouble. That's why you need a stick in front of you to wave like this. That's what I normally do. Yeah, we had a gentle little walk when we got off the bus. Then we... Uh, Got down on the beach, look a bit fossil hunting. Yeah, this has definitely been uh, cleared. A little bit brambly just there. A little bit brambly there, but not too bad. I've seen, I've been here, I've stood here once and I saw a deer just in there. It's not so bad with the branch like these trees getting in the way, but it's when you've got to go through the brambles. They can give you a nasty scratch. And the ferns hang out with the ticks, so get past that quick. You'll have to check yourself when you get home, because just doing this is enough for a tick invasion. We're nearly past the Bramble area. Oh. Yeah, we've done it. And I just have a quick look. See, look, there's one. I don't say that was ticks, that could have been. If you wear light coloured shorts, something was on me then, but I don't know if that was just plant. If you wear light coloured clothing, you can actually see if anything's on you much quicker to brush it off. But we won't really know until we get home. Because they're sneaky little buggers, they can get in your shoes and your socks and they crawl up your leg. <sighs> right. <sighs> Quick way up. Well, it ain't quick, but it's steep. This is the steepest part of the walk here. There we go, we've done it. And then when we stand here and look back, look back there, hold on, there's a tick. And 
and we look back we think god we've just come from right down there Of course, we were in the wood last week. Um, we were on a higher track, but we were on a higher but lower track, if you know what I mean, going down through. And um, we'll be actually going past similar walk, going along similar walk. So it's a, we're getting some oxygen. We're getting fresh air, oxygen, and exercise. And it's so good for you. And I feel so blessed having that beautiful beach down there. How blessed that we don't live in a city in a high rise. I'm only about my box, but it is a little cabin in Western, really. I've got to start calling it a cabin, not a box. Um, it's like a little cabin, it's a little Sheila den, where I do my tree and my videos, and I watch documentaries, and nearby I've got my lovely daughter Zara, who's also a very quiet girl, likes her own space and time, I probably interfere, not interfere, but invade her too often, but, uh, just to see if she's alright really. I do care about her. Anyway, I've got other kids which they don't live nearby so I can't and I haven't got a transport now and as I've already explained loads of times at the moment public transport is really a mess I think. Um, the trains strike in or they, have, they, they cancel and they say they've got no drivers. Um, I got all planned a week or so ago to go to Glastonbury for the day, which meant getting to Bridgewater on a train and then getting a bus, and vice versa on the way back. So I went in. I'm glad I never paid for a ticket. I went in the day before and asked the girl. She said, no, oh no, all those trains. But she did say there can sometimes be problems. She did point out that if they couldn't get a driver, there'd be no train. Even though it was peak time, just after peak time. So I had to cancel the plans for that. And I don't know when I'll do it now. I also want to go to Reading. I want to go to Reading, which isn't far. When you get off the s at Reading railway station, it's not far to the old Reading jail. They've got an exhibition on for the next two months of art and poetry and stuff to do with Oscar Wilde. I've got two connections with that prism. One, in 1976, as a student teacher, I was doing a project on education in prison. And I had to get permission from the Home Office to get access to the prison to talk to the education people in there which is what I did and I was lucky the day I went because the Broadmoor Chief Education Officer happened to be there as well so I managed to interview both of them and they also gave me a lift home afterwards it's really good anyway what happened was I had to get permission and I was Innocently, I, we were all given tape. We could have access to tape recorders while we we're doing our teacher training. Um, we, we were all exploring with cassette tapes. You know, they were the new thing in and all that in the seventies. And, um, and no one thought about confidentiality so much in those days. So you could, in, in theory, you could tape your whole class if you wanted to. I mean, nothing like that can happen now without special permissions and all that sort of thing. 
Um, and so I had this leather special case with the special college recorder in it with a strap. So I went into the prison, had my book, paper, pen, had my plan for interviewing. I'd already gone into quite a bit of detail what I was going to ask. I went prepared. So they let me in. First of all, I didn't know I hadn't shut the door properly, so a lot of alarms went off. And I thought, oh dear, I'm in trouble here. But I didn't know that I was responsible for shutting the door behind me, so I was all right. Anyway, so off we go. The, one of the prison officers led me through a series of prison corridors opening and locking doors and gates and all sorts of things to take me to the office of the education officer. So I get in, we say hello to each other. And uh, so I put my... Oh, and it's some more coming. So anyway, I put my um, tape recorder, which was in a black leather case, on the desk. And I started to talk to him, and then I started to um, get the, the tape recorder out. Is there any more coming, I wonder? And... Um, So I got, I got the tape recorder out, right? And uh, he said to me, he said, what's that? I said, oh, that's my tape recorder. And he said to me, well, how did you get that in the prison? I said, well, I didn't know I wasn't allowed to bring it in. So anyway... He said, you're not really supposed to bring tape recorders in here. I said, well, no one, no one had said that when I was uh, received the letter to come in. No one had told me that. Anyway, it was all right. And he actually allowed me to tape him. You could actually call that one of the early audio pods ever. They didn't call them audio pods in there, they called them cassette tapes. Or mini cassette tapes. So, we had quite a long conversation. And I was able to give him my structured questions, which is how I prepared that day. It could be more fluid after we'd done the main ones. I thought I'd done quite well, really. Obviously, it was an old cassette tape it's 47 years old now since that time I have transferred the recordings onto a DVD with images of various things that I'd collected about the prison and I did several copies the same when I interviewed the Broadmoor education officer who sounded just like Richard Burton, honestly, with a Welsh accent. He really did. He actually reminded me of Richard Burton. <sighs> so we had these interviews, and I also got shown around the prison. And I saw some prisoners playing pool. Uh, I went into the little education room. <sighs> but I wasn't allowed. You had to get different permission to talk to any of the prisoners. Now, these weren't any old prisoners. Reading Jail at the time housed a lot of men with problems. And they could be rapists, pedophiles, maybe murderers. That's the sort of prison it was. Sometimes they were put in this Reading Jail for their own protection. And now, of course, Oscar Wilde wrote the Ballad of Reading Jail. Very interesting. So I, since I've been to that prison 47 years ago, I've done, done a couple a lot, and I, I'll tell you why. Because when I've been doing my family tree studies, I came across the Isaacson tree in my family tree. And 
I don't know what happened, but in the Ballad of Red and Gel, it talks about the yellow pale face of doom, which she refers to as the governor of Red and Gel. Now, at that time, the pale face of doom, or gloom even, was a Governor Isaacson. I can't remember, it's Henry something Isaacson. Anyway, what happened? He's in my family tree. I was blown away by it. I couldn't believe it. I know exactly what my relationship is to him. I don't know on the top of my head, but it's all he's recorded. And it just blew my mind, really. Because I thought to myself, wow, just imagine when I'd gone to that prison when I was a young woman, age about 24, to interview the education officers. The prison that had housed Oscar Wilde. And the governor, in his ballad, was a relation of mine. Now, that has always been fascinating for me. So anyway, I, I've done a lot of stuff, collected a lot of image stuff. And um, I just, the other two days, I, I, I noticed that they were opening up the prison for an art exhibition for two months. And they, I think they're going to turn it into a museum properly. So I thought, well, I don't expect there's many people that got recordings of the education officers there and their views 47 years ago or the fact that I'm connected to the governor of Red and Gel. So anyway, I'm going to prepare. I've got it mainly prepared anyway. I'm going to, I want to go to Reddin on the train to deliver my project but I want to get hold of them first I don't want to go spend 50 quid on the train ticket more and find out that they aren't open that day so basically I want to tell them what I've got as well so that is it folks this is just a little bit of information that I've decided to reflect upon as I'm on my walk because I found the folder today I thought get it out, sort through it prepare a little pack get the tapes which are already on disc now the original cassette tapes are very very fragile now so I had to record from them and save several copies to disc along with images of pamphlets booklets my own writings because I was studying education in prison I looked at Holloway prison as well but I thought, no, the tapes would be very useful for them. It is a part of Reading's history. I am a part of Reading's history. We lived there for 13 years in Reading. I was a student there. I gave birth to three of my children in the Royal Berkshire Hospital. One hours before Kate Middleton was born. I've got my Bachelor of Education, Reading. So there's a strong connection with Reading, but at the time I was doing my study, I wasn't doing Family Tree. I had absolutely no idea of my connection to the Governor of Reading Jail. The pale face of doom. The yellow pale face of doom, he called him. And it's in the ballad. If you read the ballad of Red in Jail, you'll find it. Now, I can't remember off the top of my head the name of the governor. I know he's... I did know, but I can't remember everything. I'm not, like, looking at it every day. But he is in my Isaacson tree. I've got so much stuff I have. Oh, connected to so many people. Someone said, Sheila, you're connected to everyone. Well, I can't help that. It's just that I'm very good at digging up stuff. And it was a very small world, they call it. When, you know, you bump into someone and then you bump into someone and you say, God, that's a small world, because it is. You know, when people say, isn't it a small world? It is, it was. After the Black Death, and probably before it wasn't very highly populated England, 
And we could trace even paupers to a certain extent. Everyone was accounted for, for tax reasons, for money reasons. The paupers had to be accounted for. They had pauper books, workhouse books, <sighs> bastardry books of men who didn't pay the maintenance. There was all sorts of ways of keeping an eye on people. So, and if you've got someone of extreme importance in your family, and we've got loads, once you find one, you're right off on a lead. As soon as you find a person of significance in your tree, they will be recorded. <sighs> Big time. And it's not fantasy, it's not delusions of grandeur, it's fact. <sighs> yeah. So anyway, when I'm out walking I get these reflections. I don't know if I'll ever share this video, but I've stored it just for something to do. I might even send them a copy of this, because it's my reflection on that experience in 1976. Or it could have been even 75. I think it might be 75, actually. So it could be 48 years ago. I did a lot of work on that, and my lecturers loved the work I'd done, and they asked to borrow it, to copy the tape, and use it in their own lectures. So, somewhere else it's could be surfacing. But of course they didn't know about my family tree connection then. No, we didn't know about that then. Well, I've got it ready and I would like to go to Reddin. I'm starting a course with Cambridge University on the 4th of September so I need to really get up there soon because time's running out um, yeah I'm doing um, an archaeological and anthropological study if you like or look at um, death and burial with Cambridge University. Something I've thought would be relevant since I'm always spending a lot of time in graveyards doing family tree. I thought it's got significance. I did a bit of that when I did some uh, some stuff with the Romans. I did a course on Roman history. Roman, all sorts of stuff I did. And we looked at stuff with them about that sort of thing. You need to go over there. Oh yeah. Oh, that's it. Right then folks, I'm coming out into a beautiful sunny image now. So I'm going to turn off over and out.